Hi, so my name is Christopher Lozinski. I'm from the US. I'm currently living in Katowice. I really like Czech, so I come down here frequently. Um, OK, so I'll be speaking about pythonlinks.info. It's a catalog of the best Python videos, 639 Python videos, organized as a tree of categories and ranked by uploads versus total votes. The first five minutes of the talk, I will be speaking about the website and what it looks like, show you what it looks like. And then the rest of the talk is a much more technical technical talk about graph databases and how you use them, some history. Okay, so let's get started. If you do a web search on Python videos, um, the results vary each time, but usually it's about five or six of those Python, of the first top 10 results are paid video courses. Um, some SEO optimization gets these paid video courses in top spots. I don't want paid video courses. There's so much excellent free content. Show me the good free stuff. And if you look closer, typically um, two of them are from 2015. Uh, typically there's a data science talk from 2015, even a Python talk from 2016. Python's changed a lot. The Jupyter Notebook's changed enormously. You know, we can do way better than this with manually curated catalogs. Okay, and the worst part is if you scroll down, you basically get these infinite lists of videos. And a basic principle in human factors is you really want more than, you really don't want more than about seven or eight items in a category. You just keep scrolling forever. Okay, so if we come over to pythonlinks.info, on the home page, you'll see the 10 best Python videos overall. They're ranked by upvotes versus total votes, so it's very clear how they're ranked. Um, you can scroll in, but the best part is if you scroll down, you get a category. So here's the first category, machine learning. It's organized as a tree. Here's the next category, data science, uh, parallelism, multi-threading, multi-processing, distributed systems. Actually, we were just talking about um, multiple Python interpreters over at dinner. Uh, Python in the organization and in the community, Python skills development. Uh, Python software. So we can go back up. So it's a tree and each of those has additional subcategories. So let's actually just jump down into this first talk here about pandas. This is by a charming, um, towards pandas 1.0, um, by a charming Spaniard friend of mine in London. He did a lovely, lovely job. And you can see on the upper left hand side, you can see where we are in the hierarchy. And if you scroll left or right, this works great on cell phones, you just swipe left or right. Um, you can see the different talks on pandas. Or you can go up, and you can see the category for all the talks on pandas. We're actually going to switch here. We're going to switch from the best view to the um, one second here to the list view. So that sorry, one. We're going to switch from the best view. It's too, it's too small. Uh, list view to the list view. So in the best view, you can see the best videos in any branch of the tree. In the list view, you can just see what's on that node of the tree. So at the bottom of it are just the videos. One up, here you'll have the videos here. They're, they won't be sorted by best. They'll just be sorted by in some alphabetical order or something. You can go up. You can see data science software. You can see there are four categories here. There are no videos in this category. You can go up. Uh, here's the data science category, lots of subcategories. I think there's even one video, one or two, there's one video in there about the um, explaining the state of, and you can go back up. So it's a tree, you can browse a tree, it's really easy on a cell phone or a tablet, on a keyboard you can use keys. Um, let's go back into this talk here. Let's see, let's go back into a regular. Um, actually no, what I want to do is then videos. So here are the different conferences. So PyCon USA is the biggest one, and you can actually do a search. Um, search. And then you can see, you can search on it, you can search on DevOps, you can search on whatever you need. And then you can see all the, all the PyCon USAs organized by category. So whenever a new conference comes out, you can just zoom in on exactly the category that you want. Oh, there's a lot more you can do. Okay, so let's go back. So the thing is, it's very, if you want to be informed about updates, you can ask to get updates. And then um, you can either do it with Google or you can lo register locally. And if you do it with Google, come on, there we go. You can check in it. It asks you for some permissions. You have to, there you go, it asks you for GDPR permission. You can check through. So anyhow, I invite you to all do that. Okay, let's get on to the, oh, and I should mention one other thing. 
The other thing people talk about is PyVideo.org. So I don't know if you know PyVideo. It's kind of the, the big name in this area. Um, they started in 2008 when the videos were scattered all over the web. And so they were a single place to organize it all. Now almost all the videos are just in one place on YouTube, kind of a monopoly there. And um, by 2016, they had 200 and they had, by 2016, they had 198 annual Python conferences that were indexed there. So it's huge amounts, but it's reduced. And then by this year, they've only done eight of the annual conferences. So if you do a search, they limit you to 100. But usually, if you do a search like on Pandas, only one or two are from this year. All the rest are much older. So they've kind of gotten out of date. OK, so that's the video demo. Um, questions? Small group? I'll get on with the technical talk then. OK, so, so I did this on a graph database. The first is, the question is, you know, should you use a relational graph database? That's a, I'm not going to get into that. The question is, which, which graph database should you use? And um, there are quite a few. These are the, the big ones. Let me show you. You can see the next graph more clearly. Um, between them, they received about $250 million in venture capital. So it's, it's a, obviously a big area. Um, but they're mostly done in Java. And it was just like... It's completely obvious to me that you should use a graph database instead of a relational database. It's completely obvious to me that you should use one written in Python instead of in Java. But the rest of the world doesn't see it that way. I don't know why. Um, but actually, if you look at it, and I was like, OK, so you can add instance variables or define types dynamically. But it's much more important than that. If you actually look, so um, Neo4j, they support property graphs. They're, um, what do they what do we have? We have uh, RDF, XML, JSON key value stores, documents. So there are a number of these different models. And most of these Java things, they give you some very well-defined model. But if you use the ZODB, which is a graph database written in Python, it just gives you persistent Python. So whatever Python data structures you want to use, I mean, it's just much more flexible. And so it's not about adding an instance variable. It's about just having a completely you know, flexible data model, whatever you want to be persistent. OK. And so then the guys who use the ZODB, it's Plone, it's Pyramid, um, Flask. There's now a Flask interface to ZODB. And of course, Chrome, like you may have heard of something called Zope. Suhel Chelsu, a buddy of mine, he spent the last 10 years cleaning up Zope. He, did, he wrote something called Chrome, like you may have heard of Dolman. It's just brilliant. He's done such a good job. It's so powerful. And of course, the big users are uh, still the Plone guys. Pyramid, it's not clear who's using it and who isn't using the ZODB. The Plone guys, they're all using the um, ZODB. Just the government of Brazil alone has over 100 different um, has over 100 different websites. The president's office, the parliament office, various government offices. They have just Brazil. The government of Brazil alone has over 100 different Plone websites. So it's still very actively supported, very, very, um, very mature, very stable. Okay, so how do we use it? Well, it's really easy. Here we have a tree leaf class with an initialized method where we set the title to be something and a, and a render method that displays it. And to make it into a, Py into a ZODB object, instead of subclassing off the Python object class, you just subclass off persistent.persistent. .persistent. So you've got persistent.persistent, .persistent, which is a basic object. You've got a B tree, which um, it's a B tree on the file system, but it looks like a dictionary. And so we call those containers. You've got persistent sets, persistent lists. So you subclass off of those, and your applications become your your Objects, your graphs of objects in your applications become persistent. Um, okay, so okay, so let's take a look at how we do this. Um, on the left, we create a tree leaf object. Uh, leaf equals tree leaf. You just create a new one, and we just take the root object and we say root dot leaf equals that new leaf object. Okay, so that that's it's just Python. But really, you typically want to do a bunch of these all at the same time. So we can create two leaves, leaf one and leaf two. And we say root of leaf one is equal to leaf one. Root of leaf two is equal to leaf two. We save the transaction, and, and these objects all are persistent. Um, of course, there's some boilerplate that goes around the outside of that. You have to import it. You have to create a database. You have to get a connection. You have to get that root object. Once you get the root object of the database, you do some things, you add some things to it, you do transaction.commit, it all becomes persistent. Um, and so it's just Python. So let's take a look on this upper left-hand side. We have the, um, uh, if we want to change the title, we just go root.leaf1 and um, give it a new title. Or if you want to do a very simple query, you can do for key item and root.items print key and item. 
or if you want to delete something, let's see, is this the delete one? Yeah, if you want to delete something, delete root of leaf one transaction.commit. So ju just pure Python, really easy. You don't even notice that you're dealing with a database. And of course, here's, the other, here's really the magic here. So one of the things, if you go to my website, sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. da, 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 da. Let's go back here. Back, 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 back. Can we do this? Hmm. Let's do it this way. That works. Um, if you go to my website, you see in the upper left-hand corner, uh, there's a number. And so what I do is, for every branch of the tree, I have to calculate the number of videos in that. And the way I do it is really simple. Um, on the left-hand side, if it's a video and you ask it uh, how, how to count the leaves, it just returns one. And on the right-hand side, basically you start at the root and you go all the way down. You set the count to zero and, and you add up the count for the children. And so it's really trivial. So I submitted this to a, and actually it's quite a complex calculation for an arbitrary tree to calculate. Right? Um, so I submitted this to PyCon St. Petersburg, and they said, well, you know, can't, can't you show us a complex example? It's like, not my fault, it's so simple. Complex example. I know, if you want a complex example, we can do this in SQL, then it's a lot more complex, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for laughing. Um, and actually, in my previous application, now here I just have two classes, right? So then you have to do across two tables. But in my previous application, I did one for companies, and so then you've got um, the region, the country, region Europe, country, city, company, job, uh, and then you also have uh, GitHub repositories and Facebook pages and Twitter, and so each of these is a different class. So then you're doing a join just to find the children of a particular thing. No, you're doing a join across nine different tables. Well, that's totally, I mean, you know, that's a complex application. Whereas, so I think that this, um, if you, I think this is one of the two most important slides. If you look at um, pandas, and data analysis, and um, pandas, Jupyter notebooks, P PySpark, they're all for arrays, or they're for tables. Well, what the hell do you do if you want to do computations on trees or graphs? Well, you need some kind of persistent graphs and trees, right? So, um, so I think that this, this kind of analysis on trees and graphs is really important for the data science community. Anyhow, sorry, anybody here in data science talk to me. <laughs> Okay, so, but basically what ZODB does, it makes it really magical, right? It's not, you call it a database, but it, it just gives a really simple thing. So you reach into the database, you pull out the root object, and you do some things to it. It gives you this illusion that these objects are persistent, right? I, I don't think about reads and writes. I just, uh, occasionally, but almost never do I think about reads and writes. It's just really simple. So it makes my life much easier. And if you simplify, then you can do much more complex things. And I often talk about trees, but it's really a graph. So on the left-hand side, we're going to create two leaves. We have removed and two leaves. We're going to add the leaves to it using one of these containers. And on the right-hand side, we're going to say leaf one dot sibling is leaf two, and leaf two dot sibling is leaf one. So we have the, just the very simplest possible tree. You do a transaction I'll commit, it works, right? And of course, in my applications, it's much more complex because I have a tree. Can I ask a question? Go ahead, please. Why do you call it a leaf? It's usually called node. No, I can call it a node in checklist of check if you want. It's not check, it's English. It's uh, in graph theory, uh, a graph is considered uh, is, uh, done by uh, a set of nodes which are intermediate intermediate uh, objects in graph and the uh, end nodes are called leaves. So if you use a leaf for an intermediate node or object it's uh, Oh, so I guess these were, right, I understand. So I guess when they started off, there were leaves, and then I added siblings, so suddenly they went from being a leaf to a node. Is that the problem? Yeah. Okay. No, but uh, it's just a terminal. Pardon? It's just call them nodes. Okay. I'll just call them all nodes. How's that? Yeah. Okay, but so in my application, I have very complex. So I have, you know, I have literally hundreds of videos, and then they link to a conference, right? So two different videos may link to the same conference, and I'm starting to link to authors, and then two videos, so it's really a graph. Okay, and then you just, you don't even think about it, just do transaction document and it all works. And so for example, if you do MongoDB and you do, then it doesn't quite do transactions correctly. So there's some history about that. Okay, so where are we? Uh, persistence by reach. Okay, so we have two nodes here and we have this little triangle here and we delete one, we delete leaf one, but you can still go, we delete leaf one, so you can still go leaf two dot sibling, so you can still access it, so it doesn't get garbage collected. But then if you go delete leaf two, then the, you can't access them, they both get garbage collected. 
persistence by reachability. Okay, so the easiest way to use the ZODB is with Flask. So if you, um, how many people here know Flask? Okay, so Flask has this model, you have some functions, and then a URL, and you have this decorator, uh, you have a decorator called, what, a route, and then based on that, it, it maps the URL to a particular function. So that's kind of the simplest way to do it, but it's a very low level of abstraction. And so what most of the people in this community do, Plum, Pyramid, Cromlech, Zope guys, uh, they do traversal. So you have a tree of objects, and again, it's a tree, but it's really, uh, I'll often refer to it as tree, you start as a tree, but it's really a graph. You traverse the tree, so slash, the, the basic URL of slash comes to the root node, uh, slash software comes to the one on the right, slash software, slash um, libraries goes to the one next, and slash software, slash library, slash database libraries goes all the way down to the right. So you traverse from the, based on the UL, you traverse the object. So it's really easy to put up websites this way. And then once you find an object, you actually have to display something. So then you have this concept of views on objects. And you can see that there are a bunch of different views on this object. Um, and whatever they are, every application has different ones. And really what happens is you have different views on different nodes of the tree. So for example, you have an accounting object, one of the views will be add account, but that only operates on the accounts branch, right? And certainly, you don't want to rename the root or you don't want to delete the root, that wouldn't make any sense. You don't want to add things to the, to the leaves, not the nodes, but the leaves, you shouldn't be able to add stuff. So there's a whole complex set of rules as to who, which views can be applied to which nodes, and clone, pyramid, cromlet, I'll do this. If you want to get more advanced, there's something called Zoop.interface interface that Plone and Cromlech use. Um, and what this does is it, so here we have the interface for a, um, for a video. And so it defines the title and it defines a brief description, it defines a longer description, it gives you some meta information. And so this stuff was around in 1998. Um, and of course now it's very important because you've got um, GraphQL. So GraphQL has a meta definition that's basically the same thing. GraphQL has a few other things. Um, so Cromlech and Plone. And so if you do this, then you can, from, in principle, you can do the, um, one of these interface definitions for an object, and you can use that either for putting up user interfaces or in a client-server system, in a thick client, you can use that for defining your interfaces. And then you have to do your, your create object. So basically some stuff when you create. The first line doesn't matter. The second one, add video. That's the name that goes on the URL to actually create the video. Uh, permissions, manage. So not anybody can add a video. You have to have my manage permission to do so. Um, context. I have conferences and I have videos. And every conference, every video has to be a conference. And so I import like a whole bunch. So basically you add the videos to a conference and then you move them to another branch of the tree. Um, and you define the interface that you use because sometimes the same object you use different interfaces to pop it up and you define the subtitle and factory. And so once you do this, you get the rest of your cred for free. So you have to define a creation, but the rest happens. And when I say rest of your cred for free, sorry, um, when I say rest of your cred for free, you have to understand uh, its asset properties. So ZODB is an optimistic concurrency control database, but it also keeps versions around. So when typical relational databases, on the left-hand side, you can see the, I think it's the on the left-hand side, you can see create, create, read, update, delete. But in the ZODB world, you also have uh, rename because you can change what the URL is. Um, every node on the tree has its name relative to its parent and for traversal, so you can rename objects. You can cut an object, you can paste it, copy an object, history, restore, and then undo. So we'll, let's see if we can show you that switch back to. Uh, let's see, what are we doing here? History first. So where are we? Brochure of marketing. Uh, okay, so here's view. So I, um, so I have this marketing guy, and I asked him to do some marketing, to write some marketing literature for me. What did he do? Nice image, but the ZODB is just awesome. It's amazing. It's Fantastic, I love it, it's great, you should be using it. I, I, I don't like this, this guy did a bad job. I should I get rid of him. Um, so what, but fortunately, it's not so bad. I've got the previous version, CRUD, history. So here are all the different historic versions of this document. 
So his first, so let's see, let's see. Surf, his first, my first, I kind of like this one. Yeah, so that's the version I want. So I'm going to, first I'm going to go back to his version. Let's see if I, it's hard to do this part, it's hard to do this part of the demo on the, but we're going to copy all of this. Can I copy this? Yes. Mm. Very hard to do this. Maybe I'll skip this. Okay, we'll skip this. It's hard to edit text, but basically what you can do is you can um, go to history and you can just restore. See, there's my version. I can just restore a previous version. Come on. And then I can just crud edit it. and you get the previous version. So it's very nice to have all the different versions in there. The Plone Content Management System loves this. And so if you're doing, if I'm going to be using Emacs and, and Git, um, I only get one version in Emacs that's stored on the file and in Git the last time I did a commit. But here you get every single commit. And so it's really, I, I frequently go back a few commits to grab something. So that's one thing you get from a version control database. The other thing you get, History. So let's go to. So we navigated previously. We navigated around the user interface, but there's also this this tree of objects, and you can you can you can um, come on. Hello. Well, let's, let's see. You. Okay, let's go take a look. So one of the things is to be able to delete and restore. So let's take a look at, here's my best video. That's not the one I want. This is what I want. Okay, but, oh, the rank has changed recently. Um, so this, here's a really good video, and you may want to edit it. One second here. Manage. Forgive me. Manage. Okay, so another concept in here is adapter. So we have this, 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 these are the sort of the management interface where you browse the tree, you can browse into the tree, you can restore previous versions, you can also delete things. Um, and so it's based on a model of a tree, and so that's really easy. But actually, my real-world system is a graph. And so, um, and it's a graph for three reasons. Uh, let's show you the... Uh, da, 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 da. Um, this is... Okay, so these are canonical URLs. The problem is you change your... You ch the tree is continuously changing. And if it was just traversal, then the URLs would change, and that's a big problem. So I, what I've done is I've implemented canonical URLs. So there's a tree that you can access, but then every node has a unique name, and you can access it from the root. So that's a canonical URL. So this makes it a graph, and this actually, so my, my graph of objects, a particular video, it both is, can be traversed from its parents to the object. You can access it with these canonical URLs. That's a second path, and you can also access it through the conference. That's a third path to the node. So it's really a properly a graph. But the browser just thinks it's a tree. And so you need an adapter between the tree and the graph. And so I have those adapters. And so here when you um, go back to Google, I can delete one of these videos, right? And it, it's the, the adapter says, oh, don't just delete it. You have to delete it from its parent. You have to delete it from the canonical URL. And you have to delete it from the conference. And you can do that. And it all gets, it all just, you know, works the way it's supposed to. Come on. There we go. Bad gateway. <laughs> Reload this again. Okay, so I deleted. I just, and so it deleted, and it all just happened correctly. Oh, shit, I just deleted that video. Huh? Oh, that was stupid. I'm sorry. Ah, but it's a, it's a version database. 
right? <laughs> you all thought I was dumb, right? <laughs> so I just go back to transactions. And here's the list of transactions. And I, here's the, I deleted this one. I just undo the transaction. Okay, and now when I go back, all is good. The video is back where it's supposed to be. Go back. <laughs> go back. Cancel. I don't want that. Anyhow, the video's there. <laughs> okay, now with the talk. So you have... Um, So we have CRUD, so we have um, cut, copy, paste, delete, history, and undo. Canonical. Okay, so, so what are the advantages? Um, so we have, with zero to B, we have no relational database schema. We have no object relational mapper. There's no referential integrity problem. There's no automatic, gar there's automatic garbage collection and um, no manual reads and writes. It's a huge simplification for me compared to using a relational database. Uh, it runs on top of PostgreSQL. Um, fast, it runs thousands of transactions per second. Uh, let's see, if it does uh, hundreds, of, hundreds of gigabytes of main memory database and terabytes of, um, it has something called blobs, so you store your files in external blobs, so terabytes of blobs. Uh, that's how many, anybody recognize this number? It's two to the 64th, so that's how many objects you can have. <laughs> and then there's a, something really fun called the zero DB, which is, um, it's not actively maintained now, but what the zero DB did, it, it, there's a huge problem with privacy, like on Microsoft you have to host in the cloud, and so then the NSA knows everything that you're doing. And so what zero DB did is it did all the encryption and decryption on the client side instead of on the server side. And since the whole ZODB was written in Python, it was really easy for you guys to hack it and make it happen and stuff. So kind of an interesting, fun project. And in general, in terms of security, all the connections between the ZODB clients and the ZODB servers are all SSL encrypted. So there's my content. I'll show you two more slides. Um, a lot of what I'm doing is merging content from multiple different locations. And it's really easy for videos, because for videos, you just get a single list. But if you, when Python links started, the first thing I was doing is bringing in like awesome Python, awesome Django, awesome Flask, and each of those are trees. And so, to, so on the left, you can imagine the individual trees, maybe there's a list, and on the right, you merge them into a single tree. So having a graph database, so I wasn't thinking at the relational level, I was just thinking in terms of graph, it was really conceptually easy to do this kind of stuff. Um, if you want to contact me, there's a contact button here. Um, there's a contact information. I can actually pass out some cards. I'm gonna pass those around. Um, and then if you want to be in touch, if you want to share your information, also if you want to register on the site, you can sign up on that. There's a checkbox for your GDPR permission. Um, if you're a speaker at PyCon Check, I'd like your permission to add your name to your website. If you're um, Using an open source, for example, Cython, I've got like 20 Cython videos and they're all organized. So if you're an op working with an open source group, I'd like to make sure that all the best videos, I can't know the best videos in any area. So if you're working with an open source project, I'd like to make sure that those are listed there. Um, anyhow, any questions? Is anybody thinking of using a graph database? Go ahead. Thank you. So, um, people talk about things, they usually talk about the advantages and don't talk about the disadvantages. Well, just, just huge simplification, right? So, I get rid of an SQL schema, I get rid of an object relational mapper, I get rid of referential integrity, I just get rid of tons of junk. Simplify that. Is there a drawback? Well, you know, I mean, so I go give this talk and people, many often people are very interested and then nobody uses the ZODB, right? So there's not a very large community using the ZODB and, you know, I mean, actually, 
tons of people using relational databases, very few using graph databases. Um, everyone in graph databases using Java databases, very, use, very few using the Python ones. I don't know. I don't understand the world. <laughs> um, disadvantages. Pardon? You, you can do any um, crazy low level optimizations. You can or you can't? You cannot. Well, actually, I would argue that you can, right? Because, if, I mean, it's got C underneath, right? So they've, got, they've optimized that piece of it. But the point is, it's all Python. So I need to do some stuff. I got in, I did it. It was not a big deal. I mean, it was a little bit tricky, but not that bad. I can't, yeah. I think that you just, I mean, the, the zero dB story is really interesting. They did this whole very interesting application. Okay, it was a dud in the market. They want to, they want to, have to consult for big banks in Java. But, um, you know, I, I think it's very interesting stuff. And, um, I mean, no, is Red Hat going to start supporting the ZODB? No, because their customers don't want it, right? So, <laughs> who's not from Red Hat here? <laughs> who's not from Red Hat? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so you're going to start, you know, I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, and the other slide that was really important, I thought, was this first one, which is which graph database do you choose? I should have emphasized that one a bit more. <coughs> you know, which graph database, but um, people aren't even using graph databases, so it's like, you know. Go ahead. Your question or? Oh, no. no. Yeah, go ahead, please. Well, they did a long time ago, right? So. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't recommend Lisp, right? But. <laughs> I mean, nothing against Lisp, but I think the Python model is, you know, the car cutter stuff is way more complex than the Python model of an, uh, of an object, right? So I really like the sort of object modeling on Python. I can have the same object model in Lisp. Yeah, but it's still built on top of the complexity of a car cutter, whereas in maybe Python the implementation is a bit more efficient. Doesn't matter. What about the funding? I think it does, but what's that? Uh, so, sorry. No, go ahead. You don't have the funding there. Which one? Some, some of the, in the Orient DB and, and the other group graph, there's no funding. So is there like no funding for that? Oh, pff, who knows? I'm not an expert on those data. I don't know. I'll check. I'll do a re. I mean, so Orient. I, I think, uh, I suspect RNDB didn't get funded if I remember correct. I mean, uh, uh, some of these, uh, like the Lisp one kind of grew up organically. And so they, uh, maybe, I don't know, did they get funding or not? But yeah, they had less funding. Yeah, I guess the, yeah. That one's missing, so. Yeah, so I guess I, they, out of that consulting, they grew it, so they didn't get funding, but yes, go ahead, sir. Is uh, Postgres the only back-end choice, or is, are there other choices? Oh, thank you. I like this guy. He does everybody have a cookie for him? <laughs> <laughs> I like cookies. At PyCon Slovakia, I gave out cook chocolates for people who had good questions. One guy asked a bad question I didn't like, so. I said, no cookie for him. <laughs> and so that showed up all over Twitter, and people were like, he deserves a cookie. <laughs> so, um, so there are a number of data stores. Uh, the file, ZODB has a file system, the, the basic store. And then, um, so basically what they do is they write to the end of the file. So that's really fast, right? Um, and then you can also have blob storage. So then you take your text files, you store it outside of that. Um, and then you have this rel and you can do that client server. Um, I didn't talk about it. Okay, I'll talk about that. But you can do a client server, in which case the server has the file storage and the blob storage, and the clients just access it. You, um, so that's the, that's the Zio client server stuff. And then there's rel storage, so you can, you can store it in you see, um, Maya, MySQL or Oracle or Postgres. And then if you're using Postgres, you can also use um, NewDB, which allows you to use the indexes from from NewDB. And actually, you did ask about the, he did ask about the disadvantages. I had a slide. I should I guess I should put these slides back in. Um, the disadvantage is it doesn't do indexing well. So for relational databases, it's really easy to do select. Whereas for the ZODB, you have to write your own um, indexing. So there are a couple of lines of code to, to create a, an index. So that's the biggest disadvantage of using the ZODB. Is you have to create your own index. Go ahead. Is there any profiling capability to know where you need to add an index or where one is needed? 
Um, I guess like, if you have performance so, of flow, can you diagnose that problem? So, um, yeah, well, so certainly you have all the Python profiling tools. Um, secondly, ZODB does a great job of caching stuff, and so performance is, you know, generally, I, I haven't run into the performance problem at all. In fact, it's really fast. Um, the, the time when you're going to hit a performance problem is when you have to hit an object and it has to hit the database, and then you go to the next object and it has to hit the database, and the next object and you have to hit the database. So if you have that where you're, you're doing multiple, you're traversing some complex tree and you're doing multiple database accesses which weren't cached, um, and so then the solution is they can, um, for like at startup, you can say, please load the following objects all at the same time. So there's some solutions to that. Um, uh, I'm, it's Python, you know, even, there's either a tool there, if it's not, it's Python, it's really easy to put a few lines of code in there and, and track, track what the, um, well actually you would do it on, you'd probably do it on every time you access the disk, right? So you'd, you'd do some kind of performance monitoring right there. Yeah, it can't be hard to do. Okay, did the did this did the my business cards make it all the way around? Question All right. Uh, <laughs> I like this group. That there is something about uh, writes or reads. Uh, so when I have some really large database with tons of accesses, uh, write accesses, and uh, suddenly uh, a lightning strikes my server and uh, it, uh, it it goes out. How large rollback could there be? Yeah, so there is something called, there's an open source project called Zope Replication Services. Um, and so what that does is it uses sort of all the low level techniques to make a backup copy just every time a transaction happens. Which is so, so that's not a problem. So it happens um, for, uh, for uh, access? Yeah, for every, um, so basically what you're doing is you're, you're right, so when you write to the end of the file, all the objects that are touched get put to that to that single transaction as a little piece. Actually, let me show you there. Oh, maybe I shouldn't have cut all these slides out. <laughs> okay, so um, it's a. Uh, um, let's do it against this. So when you commit a transaction, all the objects are all um, added to the end of the file, right? And so then there's a whole bunch of these, and eventually you pack the file, right? So Eventually what happens is you have these, these um, different versions of the object are sort of all over the place and when you pack it, it they get object one, object two, and object three, they're also all different versions of the same and when you pack it, the, the objects, versions one and version two get deleted. Um, and here you have, oh, Kurt, that's a slightly different slide, sorry. So um, if you imagine if you're doing a chat, a chat conversation, there would be d different, um, a sequence of messages in a chat conversation would be sort of scattered all over, and then you can just write them, you can touch them all as a single transaction, and then they'll all be written at the same place at the end of the file. So there's a huge problem in sort of Internet of Things that if you collect, you have all these sensors or chat rooms, and you want to collect each one to a single file, but then on read, on write, your disk is jumping all over the place. And so what people do is they put them all in a single file, but then on read, your disk is jumping all over the place. And so what the ZODB allows you to do is every 10 or 100 transactions, you can just touch them all and they all come t together at the, end, at the end of the file. And um, how often are the uh, writes uh, happening? Is it uh, like uh, every uh, periodically in time, like every 10 seconds? No, so, every, so a transaction is committed by writing the transaction and the transaction is not committed until the transaction is written. And they can do thousands of, of transactions a second. And, um, Repeat your first question again about... Uh, the first question? Yeah. Uh, uh, I took how a... large rollback would happen to me if my server goes out? Oh, with this, yeah, so you can use the Zope replication services. And there are two companies that are doing something new with actually technologies I didn't heard. So there's another way of, of doing this replication stuff also. In Brazil, actually, they're doing it. And this one guy in Germany did the same thing. Some, some, we can look that up if you want. But, so there are two different ways of backing the whole thing up. Uh, but the bigger problem is it is an optimistic concurrency control database. And so um, what it does is it assumes that not right conflicts. So it's not like for airline reservation systems where two people are competing for the same seat. It's you know, for content management systems and things like that. So um, and it's great you know, for like my video publication. It's not like everyone's hitting and writing at the same time. Right? Um, 
And so, so you, you want to be aware of the class of, of things that it, it works well for. Maybe that's a good reason to use a Java application. I don't know. <laughs> um, so what happens if you do two writes in the same Well, they, they get a, they, so for example, there are different kinds of writes. If you do, um, say two people register at the same time, right? <coughs> well, there's a B tree and you're adding two different things. Well, the B trees understand that and they can, they can handle that. But if it's some two people writing to the same object, you get a conflict and they throw an error. And um, if, the, if the database doesn't resolve that error, then the end user application has to resolve that error. Right. So, so it retries a couple of times. So it's like correct. That. You get an error. Yeah, you get an error. Yeah. Yeah, you get a, you throw it. Exactly. It's correct. You get an error. <laughs> it's well, better than silently. Right, exactly. It's correct. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you.